okay, so one thing you guys can't see um, is that over the course of almost an entire year of like <laughs> giving every lecture for an entire year on this wall of my house, um, every other like square inch of my wall is now littered with like red and black and green marks or like smudges from when I just touch it with my fingers. So I'm very definitely going to have to repaint this entire wall once I remove these. Uh, it's going to be like pure white or whatever, pure cream, and then just smudges all over. Um, again, the joys of having a, a, a life of being a COVID professor. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, on with this though. And let's take our probability distribution now, which we now understand to be psi squared. And let's consider what is the most likely position for a particle if we know that thing, psi. And by, by ex expected position, I want to very clearly say, I'm going to try, we're going to try to calculate what the expectation value of a function is. Okay, so that's what that question means. How do we calculate the expectation value of x, of the position? And again, to be clear, we're asking, what is the most likely answer for where that particle will be? If you know what that function already is. So, recall. The expectation value of any function, if you know a probability distribution, so thinking classical probability distributions, the expectation value of any function, f of x, is given by this. You take the integral of uh, well, that function f of x weighted by how likely that, uh, that answer x is to be at all points, so across all range. Now, this was from the last lecture, but again, and I'll write it on the side of here. So the most likely value of that function is going to be given by taking that function and weighting it by how likely it is. So if there's a function that, that depends on x, but the probability distribution is very tightly peaked at a certain position, you know that the most likely value of that function is whatever it is at that point. And I hope that makes sense there. Um, if not, again, come back to this maybe after doing a couple examples and it will make sense. So in our case, what we're going to do is we're going to use this exact same formula, but we're going to set this equal to x, and we're going to set our probability distribution, or probability density, I should say, equal to psi of x squared. Now, note here again, I'm slipping into the just spatial part of it. So just for ease of notation, I'm going to ignore the time dependence. So we're strictly just going to like evaluate at a certain given time t. Uh, the rest of this integral stays the same. So we have a dx multiplied by integration, and this is just x. Okay, so let's unpack this just a little bit now. I'm going to rewrite it over here. This x is, it will be found by an integral of, I don't know what, oh, yeah from negative infinity to infinity. Now, remember, this thing here is actually computed by taking psi complex conjugate times psi itself. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I, I can rearrange this, so this is just a function, this is a function, this is x, which is a function, and if we're multiplying them all together, we can just rearrange the order however we want. So I am just going to arbitrarily rearrange the order. I'm going to write psi conjugate of x times x times psi of x dx. And this is the proper way to calculate the, ex the expected value of x for any given function. You take the complex conjugate times x times the function itself. Now, this doesn't have too much meaning without doing examples. And we will do examples, but I just want to get the basic framework for computing that out at this point here. 
Now, there's a, something that's pretty important to note here, though. If psi squared, so going back to this way of writing it, if psi squared is an even function, in other words, if psi squared is something that surrounding zero, let's say it looks like that kind of <laughs> butt-looking lobe thing, um, if it's an even function, in other words, if, it, if you can flip it left and right and it's symmetric, if you sandwich our function just uh, x in there, which is odd, uh, that's not the function, <laughs> function x looks like this, dang it. Um, anyway, so if you take a, the integral of an even function with an odd function, what's the answer going to be? And this, this should be a rule that you've come across by now. If our function psi squared is in fact even, this will always end up being zero. And that's good because any function psi squared, again, that's what this black line is indicating, psi squared, any function that's symmetric about the zero point will always be likely, equally likely to occur on the left as it will on the right. So when you're actually practically calculating this value, expectation value of x, or in other words, the most likely position to find a particle, it's common sense that if it's perfectly evenly distributed about that zero point, you're guaranteed the most likely point to find that particle, or the expectation value, is zero. Even though, for example, in this case, the, the, the actual probability of finding that at zero is zero, the expectation value, we say, is zero. Meaning that you're no more likely to find left of it than right of it. So that's just kind of one trick to kind of keep in the back of your mind when you actually do do these calculations that if, that, if the psi squared is even, then you can immediately set this whole integral to zero. Um, and I'll tell you, it, the, further you, you, the further on you go in physics, you try to find every excuse not to actually do an integral. And lots of times, the, the, the best way to avoid doing an integral altogether is say, hey, it's an even times an odd, it's zero. Uh, so, uh, but this is what we mean by the expected value of x. And this brings up another really good point. This is actually what we call a quantum operator. Um, and I'm actually going to even simplify that a little. Um, the function, and I'll put it in quotes, why not? X is a quantum operator. And we'll see more examples of this. Specifically, the next one is going to be momentum. But what I mean by a quantum operator, and I'll describe it on two levels here. Number one, it's a question that we can ask. In this, in this case, we're asking a question of what is the most likely place we're going to find you if you're described by psi? So it's an operator in the sense that it will, it, 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 it's, it's, I'm trying to do an analogy in my head and it's not working, but it's a question that we can ask and the function psi will give us an answer. So if we ask, where are you, given our function of psi, we perform that integral and we get out our answer. So on the one hand, a quantum operator is essentially a measurable result or an observable quantity based on our psi. An observable result or a measurable quantity based on psi. And there's going to be other operators. For example, the next one we're going to discuss immediately hereafter is the momentum operator. And the momentum operator is just simply, we ask, a, we ask this function psi, hey, what is your most likely momentum? And that's li literally all it is. We have a energy operator. We say, hey, what is your energy? Uh, so literally any question that you can ask that comes out to have a measurable, observable result is what we call a quantum operator. 
Now, the other way of answering that, the, the second deeper level, is it's a function that you sandwich between psi star and psi. I, that looks funky, so I'm going to get rid of that. Um, but again, I'll repeat that. A quantum operator is a function that we put between those two things. So I'll make that a little bit more general here. I, I hope you can read that, but I'll write that out. It's a function that we can sandwich between psi star and psi. So in this case here, we take an integral, I'll leave out the endpoints, psi star, and then any function that we put in there multiplied by psi dx, whatever we sandwich inside there, we now call a quantum operator. So we'll see more examples of that, like I said, but this, this word is going to come up over and over, and so think of it as both a observable question that we can ask and a mathematical function that we just put between those two things. Um, and then we're going to we're going to put one third, we're going to put a third level here later on. I'm not just going to write on my wall. Um, but there's a really nice, easy way of notating this that's due to uh, Dirac, when uh, uh, Paul Adery, Maurice Dirac, he's the only person with four names that everyone always calls by all four. Um, but anyway, uh, there, there's a cool way of notating this that take, takes care of all that like gibberish. Uh, anyway, again, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So let's go ahead and talk about the, the position operator, uh, sorry, the momentum operator next.